risk is uh, obviously as you digitize, uh, you will need to look at your cybersecurity uh, and invest in it and, uh, and invest in your systems, knowing your customer platform as well. But this is something banking is investing in because you are digitizing in all your products uh, and trade is one of them. Uh, similarly, your other products that we offer in banking wealth management or uh, any financing product. Um, but, but at the end of the day, the end game is how to move faster for the client, how to be more efficient. Because if we don't transform in banking, you know, you'll be out of business. I'm a, a big fan of uh, the DeFi as a technology. Um, you know, uh, you can't be talking about financial inclusion without uh, highlighting how important uh, that is. Simply look at it, what is financial inclusion is all about? It's about convenience, ease of access, correct? Uh, it's about transparency and uh, security and economics, cost. True. Right? If you take each and every one uh, of those, you will see that uh, DeFi uh, stands out. When banks are engaged with uh, DeFi, I, I would think that they have to look at uh, the project teams, uh, code ethics, code uh, audits, internal policies are very important, controls, working with the regulators uh, uh, very closely, and most importantly, educating both their people, their staff, and the clients as well. Uh, when it comes to customer trust, um, it's an ongoing relationship with every organization, and I think uh, customers, all different types of customers, being individuals or even other businesses, uh, trust is what makes it or breaks it when it comes to building that relationship. Um, when it comes to security and privacy, um, I think uh, one of the, I heard a lot of people asking, how do we prioritize security and privacy? And the answer to that is, uh, it's not a question of prioritization, it should always be a priority. Having said that, uh, and how do organizations protect their um, customers' uh, data, is basically knowing what is at risk. Uh, understanding your business context, understanding the use case that you're trying to implement or even the product that you're trying to offer and identify where are the risky areas, where is in which layer of my uh, offering actually lies the risk. Once you understand that, then you basically move into the concept of privacy by design and security by design. We have a practice in Digital Dubai Authority where probably many, many years ago we used to have security reviews uh, comes later on in the product development. Once we have the product ready uh, to launch, we, gen we then you know, involve security teams to review. Today, the security teams actually with us in the design of the, you know, uh, idea itself and conceptualizing the idea of the product or a service. This ensures, you know, the design have embedded controls when it comes to protecting data and ensuring that there is uh, all the loopholes actually addressed or the risks are actually addressed before we launch any product or service. Once you have that, practice in place, then you continue educating your customers. So uh, your customers also have the right to be aware of what are your measures? How are you protecting my data? How do I trust dealing with you uh, and engaging with you as an organization? Another aspect of it is basically working very closely with the industry. There are a lot of uh, organizations who work day and night to develop solutions. Uh, and tools for you to secure uh, you know, the data and make sure that your product and services are offered with minimum risk, uh, you know, because um, risk will always be there, basically. So having secure security by design, privacy by design, and be aware and making your customers aware, engaging with the customer, with the, with the industry uh, experts. I think everyone is excited about uh, the use of big data, AI, Gen I, uh, particularly gen generative AI. Um, I know it's still in the nascent stage, but if you look at the use cases that are currently evolving, that touches uh, client experience, uh, risk management, uh, fraud prevention, uh, this is the new uh, frontier uh, right now. And uh, I think it presents a fantastic opportunity for financial institutions, fintechs, and the regulators alike uh, to harness uh, this new technology to deliver uh, impact across uh, both uh, risk controls and plant experience. So I think overall customer experience has seen a massive shift over the last few years, right? especially post-COVID. 
And, and the more and more we see customers, they are in increasingly buying experiences, not products. Yeah. And, and one of the biggest shifts that I've personally seen is uh, the whole notion of hyper-personalization, where the old days of where you can offer the same experience to any customer is now gone. You need to really deliver, each customer is expecting the right product at the right time, delivered through the right channel. Yeah. And that becomes a very different problem to solve, and that's where you know, a, a data and AI comes into the play, where you really need to personalize these offerings uh, to be able to adapt to the customer needs, right? I think building on that, the other trend that I see is also around, since the customers are interacting in so many different channels, you need to orchestrate the experience which is seamless across different channels, yeah? So in banks now, you know, customers want to start their journey on the mobile app, sometimes they want to finish it in the branch depending on the product, or it could be vice versa as well. So orchestrating this experience has become very important. And last but not the least, I think for customers, their experiences have been shifted by the big techs of the world. So they are now you know, used to buying products from Amazon, Google, and they like that intuitive experience. And they're expecting that from all industries, including banking, yeah. And also the, on the government side. So, so all of that you know, has given a tremendous shift in terms of customer expectations. And from what we see, how organizations are adapting to it, there are two things. One, a lot of large organizations have been traditionally product-centric. Yeah. And that is true for banks and other organizations. And now we are helping more and more clients become customer-centric. Everybody is learning through the process, but I think it goes back to the ultimate goal uh, and ultimate balance between enabling the growth of that technology and using it for the benefit of the citizen, for the benefit of uh, the society, because there is a lot of, of potential to it. Mm. And having some sort of uh, regulatory framework that protects uh, the people from it as well. When it comes to who should do what, I think everyone should do something about it. Uh, we've been talking about privacy for a very long time. We've been talking about security for a very long time. I mean, uh, we all participated in events maybe 10 years ago, and we we're talking about exactly the same thing that we're talking about today. Uh, I think it's time for us to stop talking and, <laughs> and taking doing. action, right? With the uh, initiation of the Dubai, Dubai, Dubai Digital Authority maybe one year and a half ago, the message was very clear from the management or from the leadership of the city. They said digitizing life in Dubai. They haven't mentioned the government, they haven't mentioned services, they haven't mentioned anyone. It's digitizing life in Dubai. This basically means it's not only the government you know, responsibility, it's the entire ecosystem responsibility to digitize life and really make uh, you know, life, uh, quality of life uh, uh, of the citizens and residents and investors and tourists really of a high quality and as per the expectation. And uh, moving from that basically, partnership with the private sector became an important pillar, uh, an important uh, you know, uh, enabler for us to achieve that goal. I think that the challenges um, for the regulatory side of, of, of this uh, debate are, are probably twofold. Mm. One is um, working together and cooperating uh, simply because um, cross-border financial services are not new but cross-border virtual assets, crypto, digital currency business introduces some new factors that make cooperation between regulators and regulatory bodies absolutely essential. Um, so so that, that's the, fir the first issue is, is around cooperation and that's always a challenge. It's not new it's, but it's, it's clearly a challenge. Secondly, the actual technology itself and understanding the technology and the use cases and so on. There's a lot of, a lot of um, efforts and initiatives going on. I mean, on OECD level, uh, FSB, uh, the, the uh, global uh, stablecoin arrangements or crypto asset framework. So it, it, it is happening, but I still think we're still just seeing the beginning of it. Uh, and there's still a lot of work to be done in that field uh, to, to enable that, but it is necessary because financial innovation does not know any geographical, <laughs> political boundaries and, and as such, uh, um, yeah, well, is, a, is a, a challenge that has to be addressed also with a global solution. Unless you make a mistake, you don't know where the gap is, right? So you've got to allow for something to, to crash to a certain degree in order to know what the implications of that would be in terms of a ripple effect on the wider ecosystem. The role that we see ourselves play as a regulator is not to prevent the gap from happening, but to be able to minimize the exposure of risk there. How do you ring fence 
that to be only borne by individuals, organizations that are able to bear it, able to withhold it, and then rise back up, as opposed to it affecting the masses, right? How do you limit the damage that something can, can create, but not prevent something from even being tested, assuming that damage is going to happen? So fear of the unknown is not the way we, we allow this industry to, to operate in. And the regulatory mindset often tends to be that, because traditionally that's how we've existed, right? So this gives us all a chance to rethink what regulation should be for the future as well. And it needs to be co-created. It needs to be public-private partnership. Well, I, I believe that uh, blockchain for us has been a major revolution uh, because it allows us to actually transform uh, business ra radically as it applies to payments, especially through the usage of uh, distributed ledger technology, which substantially reduces uh, costs and speed and transparency of payments. Um, when we start applying protocols like, for example, DeFi, which also democratize, uh, or sometimes we call banking the unbanked, or even help uh, in developing um, systems like microloans, which are very powerful in countries like, for example, Pakistan, and over 50 countries in Africa, not all of them using that, but it, it substantially helps um, uh, bank uh, the unbanked. I think one of the probably biggest uh, changes associated with blockchain, it's not just the fact that you can actually tokenize the value, but it's also the fact that it's programmable money through smart contracts. Right. So it, it is very important in the area of what we call sometimes supply chain and contract management. Central bank digital currencies uh, have a very negative connotation these days with them, right? They come with a connotation of control, they come with a connotation of uh, programmable money being something negative. Factually speaking, that is incorrect. Because really in today's world, and, and, and unfortunately the wars that have happened all around the world or the sanctions that are happening in the region, show us that governments, when they have to, can always control the flow of money. The benefit of CBDCs though, is that the flow of money can move in a more transparent, in a more traceable, and a more trusted way. Right? So CBDCs aren't something bad, although you know, when you open the newspapers you can find many arguments against CBDCs. CBDCs put the burden on the central bank down, they enable the central bank to start adopting new technologies, and money supply as we know it today is always controlled by the government. We will see CBDCs becoming more and more a traditional method of payment because again they're based on blockchain and they enable us to transact less with less friction and with lower cost in the background. Personal data is one of those areas where you don't want to divulge too many information about yourself but want to get the most benefit out of blockchain. Even when it comes to, to payments, payments for things like uh, uh, giving up a little bit of privacy for uh, getting uh, rewards either in payments or in services, and this slider is now at the power of the consumer rather than the power of the platform. Uh, so this kind of empowerment using blockchain technology will play a big role moving to the future, not only on the health and longevity side, but also on the bringing more you know, value to the data on a micro scale and also on the on the large scale as well. Any kind of encryption gives you protection for a period of time. So you can say security is always a race against time. So it's not forever. Uh, quantum encryption and uh, quantum computing, and in our case, GPU-based computing, which is also driving AI, shrinks that amount of protection time. What we're doing on the other side is we're creating quantum-resistant blockchains. And some of the existing blockchains that are already in place today have already quantum resisting seeds that get put inside to extend the life of that blockchain. The good thing is that blockchain by itself is an open source and it's a democratic system. So any kind of vulnerabilities that get, get identified can easily be corrected uh, within a relatively short period of time. Quantum computing is a reality. It's not science fiction anymore. It's there, it's accessible via cloud. Having said that, 
a lot of fear mongering is happening right now around blockchain breaking because of quantum computing. And sometimes that can happen. Having said that, the base assumption is that quantum computing will rise and no defense mechanism will rise with quantum computing, which generally is not what we've seen. Blockchain provides three kinds of uh, value takes that are uh, being realized, but the education around it is not sufficient, uh, in my opinion, very humble opinion, and uh, I think maybe Salah can uh, tell you more about that. But, uh, you know, exchange of value is one, uh, record keeping and neutralization is the second one, and of course, uh, uh, smart contracts and programmability of it with AI and that kind of stuff. This hasn't been realized. Yes. Autonomous yeah. agents, for example, for, for paying for things and making sure that they get the best deal for you if you're trying to buy something. All these things are still not realized in a big mass scale. A super app in our definition is an ecosystem of integrated services. So it's not just about aggregating content and aggregating services because this might as well be some of the I would say misperceived uh, uh, concepts of a super app in the region. It's how we create value out of each adjacent use case. And for that, uh, we have evolved as, as, as a company from the financial services space. So that was our core pillar in uh, building a super app. Again, one of the things about super app, you just don't build a super app. You evolve to become a super app. There are three pillars that when we think about the super app that we rely on. Good. Number one, reliability. If the super app isn't reliable, if it cannot effectively scale, if the page load times aren't in line, your customers won't last very long. Number two, it comes down to convenience. If the customer has to relearn navigation between each of the applications, you're in trouble. You'll see churn very, very fast. And so building a cohesive, uniform experiences across your application is critical. And the third one, I think the most important one, is value. If you can bring value to your consumer, value from the sense that today we run something called a subscription program called C+. For about $5 a month, you're in a situation where you're getting discounted rides, you're getting free food delivery, and those experiences bring value to the consumer. So not only have you provided them a reliable experience, something that is convenient to use and brings value. I think those three fundamentally define a successful super app versus an unsuccessful one. The lifeline of a company is its customer. The most expensive part of the entire journey is customer. Mm -hmm. So the more customers you have on the platform that love the product and never leave you, the better. And accordingly, think from the customer first, make sure that reliability is a very important part of your menu. If you serve 16,000 plates in your restaurant and all of them suck, they're not gonna come back. Mm -hmm. If you have one good burger, they're gonna continue to come. So reliability is one. Having a solid data infrastructure that gives you the ability to show the customer the right thing at the right time so the customer conversion continues to be relevant so you're not showing them the wrong thing or just a white labeled experience all across makes it even more enjoyable for the customer to continue to stick around.